how big is the hydrogen atom? What is the radius of the hydrogen atom? That's right, we're doing quantum. Quantum, quantum, quantum. I have chosen this textbook. You see, the hydrogen atom as a problem is usually an entire chapter of any quantum mechanics textbook. So for reasons I will elaborate on later, I have chosen this one, my favorite one, it's Shankar. And for reasons I will elaborate on later, I will tell you why it's an entire chapter in every single quantum mechanics textbook. So strap in though, because this is a long, <laughs> this is a long discussion. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So let's talk classical mechanics. There's a problem. So classical mechanics is pretty solid. It gives us Maxwell's equations, like a complete electrodynamics theory and all that good stuff. But in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when we start learning more about like particles, we, we, we see the electron, we start poking at it. We realize that classical mechanics has a huge problem. The thing is, is that accelerating charged particles will emit radiation, which means that if you have an electron on an orbit around a proton, it should accelerate, lose energy, emit photons, and spiral right into the nucleus. And yet they don't do that. Like, uh, atoms seem pretty stable. So what what's going on there that's kind of breaking classical mechanics? That's a problem. So Bohr's model of the atom is kind of a planetary model. He talks about the nucleus and the electron much smaller orbiting around it. And instead of gravity pulling like Jupiter towards the sun, you have the Coulomb force pulling the electron towards the nucleus. Uh, but of course the electron's orbit is supported by angular momentum. So it shouldn't actually fall in just like Jupiter shouldn't fall into the sun. And he does something really interesting here where in his model he suggests that the angular momentum like allowable angular momentum of an electron is quantized there are specific energy levels the electrons allowed to be on and it will not be anywhere else and this is a very quantum mechanics thing to do he was of course inspired by Planck who had earlier a few years earlier described the black body radiation as being light quanta little light packets rather than just continuum of light ejection. Bohr takes this idea knowing that moving electrons will produce light and says, well, then the electrons must also be quantized if light is quantized. And that's pretty, that's a smart move. It's a really interesting quantum -y application to a classical mechanics problem. Before I forget, I should mention to you, you have probably heard that Einstein was very unhappy with quantum mechanics. And yet, if you look at the history, he made enormous contributions to quantum mechanics. Even Planck didn't have the, the courage to stand behind the photons that were implied in his own formula. Einstein took it to be very real and pursued it. So when you say he doesn't like quantum mechanics, it's not that he couldn't do the problem sets, it's that he had problems with the problems, okay? He did not like the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, but he had no trouble uh, divining what was going on. So it's, it's quite different. It's like saying, uh, I don't like that joke. Well, there are two reasons. Some guys don't get it and they don't like it. Some guys get it and don't think it's funny. Let's look at the Bohr model. The force holding it together is the Coulomb force. And the thing preventing the electron from spiraling in is it's circular motion. And we can rearrange that and solve for angular momentum and get m squared, v squared, r squared, which is angular momentum squared. And this is the restriction that Bohr imposes. It's a postulate. He says, this angular momentum is equal to n, which is an integer, standing for the different levels of the electron shells, times h, which is Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi. And he just says, this has to be true for our electrons. And we can plug that in to this formula, rearrange again, and solve for r. And we get that r, which is going to be the distance from the proton to the electron, which is what you know the radius of the hydrogen atom. Neat. We're so close to getting the answer, and we're only, what, like seven minutes in? That's awesome. Okay, so r is equal to n squared, which is just an integer, 
times epsilon naught times h squared divided by pi times the mass of the electron times the charge of the electron squared. All of those things are either constants or measurable, like we can just measure the mass of the electron, and that whole thing is called a naught. So the radius of the hydrogen atom is equal to n squared times a naught, where a naught is called, what do you know, the Bohr radius. Um, because if we put n equal to 1 for the ground state hydrogen atom, we get that r is equal to a naught, which is equal to 0 0.53 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And 10 to the minus 10 is an angstrom, which is a unit that like atomic physicists sometimes use, which makes sense because when you're looking at object of this size, a naught is just going to be 0.53 angstrom, which is much handier. This is a side note, but I'm really into names. And I was hoping that angstrom was from the word angst. I know strom is like stream or river, so it would be funny if this name meant like angry river or something. But I looked it up and angst is a place in Sweden and there is a river there, so it's probably just from the town by the river is the last name. But that's fine. It's fine. Okay, but we did it. We have the Bohr radius. <laughs> 0.53 angstrom. But the Bohr model also makes predictions. It makes predictions on the energy levels of these electrons. So what's going to happen is you have some ground state electron, n equals 1, and if you shove energy into it, that electron will move to a higher energy level, which means it will gain energy. And that's not where it wants to be, right? It wants to be in the lowest energy shell. So it will gain energy, move up, and then very quickly emit a photon and jump back down. And the thing is, is the photon it emits will be exactly equal to the energy in that change. So we can use the Bohr model of the atom to make a prediction on the exact value of the wavelength of the photons that are emitted in this atom which is a really nice prediction to make because you can just calculate the wavelength of the photons and then just go take some spectra and measure it. So, so let's, let's do that calculation. So the energy of the ground state electron is going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, and we know the potential energy on that electron is going to be due to the Coulomb potential. Uh, we can calculate the kinetic energy because it's one half mv squared, and we, we just calculated mv squared over r, so we can just plug that in. And we get the energy is minus one half, one over four pi epsilon naught e squared over r. It's negative because it's, it's a binding energy, and as you add energy to the electron, it becomes less negative. And once it's above zero, it can escape the atom. You, you've freed it. The atom is ionized now. You've done it. So we can plug in what we know is the Bohr radius, what R is, into this energy calculation and just put in the numbers and we get that En is equal to minus 13.6 eV over n squared. So if n is equal to 1 for our ground state, that electron has an energy of minus 13.6 eV. I'll put up a table for the first couple of energy states. Uh, the ground state is going to be the most negative and it will decrease, become less negative until you get a free electron. If we want the frequency or the wavelength of the photon that's emitted, we just need to calculate delta E. Like what is the shift in energy from n equals 2 to n equals 1? And that looks like this. And then we can use the Planck-Einstein equation which says that for a photon, delta E is equal to hf, which we can use to calculate the frequency. Once Bohr has made all of these calculations and he says these are the six frequencies that will be emitted from the hydrogen atom, you can just go and measure that in a lab and confirm that Bohr's model is making accurate predictions for what the energy levels of the hydrogen atom are. Of course, though, Bohr already knew what these values were supposed to be. The Balmer and Lyman series of hydrogen lines had already been well studied. so. This just must have been a very exciting day at his desk when he saw the numbers that matched the observations that we already had. But the Bohr model is wrong. It accurately describes the spectra to a point, but, but it is wrong. You know, electrons cannot be described like classical particles. He doesn't really solve the problem with the electrons spiraling in. He, he's like, no, 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 there's only allowable 
angular momentum levels. They're on specific stationary orbits. He calls them stationary orbits. The electron's not actually moving. It's not actually a moving charge, so it can't emit radiation. It's not doing that. It's stationary. But that doesn't make sense. That doesn't pass the smell test. That's that's a red flag. A stationary orbit. What does that mean? He doesn't say why. What physically prevents the electron from spiraling in? What's actually going on there? But we're in the future, right? We know that Bohr cannot solve this problem because Bohr is not doing quantum mechanics. The electron's not a particle. You can't treat it like a particle. You cannot treat it classically like a little planetoid Jupiter moving around the sun. That's not how electrons work. Electrons are waves. You have to use quantum mechanics. <laughs> I mentioned that this problem is in every single quantum mechanics textbook, and that's for two reasons. The first is that it's just a really nice little problem. It's very pretty, right? You have this big, giant hole in classical mechanics. It's not working. It's huge. There's a problem. And Bohr comes in and he does a quantum-like adjustment to classical mechanics, and suddenly he's getting the right answers. But it's not the right answer. And it's not the right answer because you need quantum mechanics. So when you are introducing quantum mechanics, this is like a lovely little bridge. It's a journey to go on to be like, well, this is why we need quantum mechanics. The particles are not actually particles. We need something new. The second reason the hydrogen atom is in every single quantum mechanics textbook is because it's literally the only problem that you can solve the Schrodinger equation for. I mean, <laughs> You can do you can do a harmonic oscillator and you can do some potentials, but but as an actual like physics problem in the confines of like a classroom where you have three 45 minute lectures a week, the hydrogen problem is literally the only one you can do. All future problems you solve analytically in quantum mechanics are like, what approximations can we make to take this problem and make it look like the hydrogen atom? Because we know how to do that one. You can do perturbation theory and all that stuff, but actual quantum mechanics done analytically is very very limited you have to do it numerically with computers which is hard to do on a chalkboard so you do the hydrogen atom the reason i chose this book specifically is because i used this book for my quantum mechanics class in graduate school in oh my god like 2015 so years and years ago and it was years and years ago and i remember a specific hilarious line from this book so when i said ooh I want to do the hydrogen problem, I knew I would do this book so I could share with you the joke. Shankar sets up this chapter in a really interesting way, which I like. He does the Schrodinger equation, which we're going to do in a couple minutes, and then he talks about like the numerical estimate, and he kind of walks you through what I just did with Bohr. How Bohr got to the right answer, even though he didn't actually get to the right answer. And then he talks about how you would measure this experimentally, which I also think we should do at the end of this video. That would be very fun. But briefly, in his numerical estimates, he mentions the fine structure constant, which is alpha. Alpha shows up when you're doing quantum mechanics and involving electrodynamics. It's a very important quantity. It's very important in QCD. It shows up a lot. But the thing about the fine structure constant is that it's dimensionless. It doesn't matter what units you're working with. It always has the exact same value. And that value is 1 over 137. And some physicists are kind of obsessed with this. They're just like, why? Why is it 1 over 137? And let me read you the line. Thus, although no one tries to explain why c is equal to 3 times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second, several attempts have been made to arrive at the magic figure of 1 over 137. Since it is a god-given number independent of mortal choice of units, one tries to relate it to fundamental numbers such as pi, e, e to the pi, and pi to the e, the number of space-time dimensions, etc. Anyway, <laughs> got em. I read this and I was like, this guy gets me. And ever since, I've had a parasocial friendship with Shankar. I don't know him. I've never met him. I would not recognize him on the street, but I feel like he gets me and we would be friends. And that's weird. Don't tell him I said this. Um, the thing is though, <laughs> there's a certain type of physicist who's like, why is it one over 137? This must be very important. What does this mean? 
And I just, I just think that's kind of a lame and uninteresting question. Like physicists who start talking about this kind of leave physics and enter like numerology and religion and it turns into like multiverses and fine tuning. And that's it's fine if that's what you want to talk about, but it's just like not physics. And so I'm not really interested in that. It's got the same energy as like a group of college freshmen who have smoked pot for the first time and they're like, oh my god, what if the blue that you see isn't the blue I see? And it's just like, if God is real and he makes hell specific to a person, my literal version of hell would be like two campfires and for eternity I have to like sit at one of them. So I'm constantly like walking over to the one with the old physicists who are like, I've done a Fermi problem on the number of electrons and one over 137. And I just like make the Seinfeld face and walk over to the other campfire. And it's just those college freshmen being like, well, actually communism after the Bolshevik. And I just like, and try to walk back and just forever and eternity, I'm just dealing with that. The least interesting conversations in the world. And I'm stuck there forever. And... <laughs> I feel like I'm putting words in Shankar's mouth because he just said this sentence, but he gets me. He's hilarious. This book is so good. It's, it's very funny. I mean, if you're looking for a funny book, I would buy like an actual comedy book. But if you're looking for a funny book and you also have to learn quantum mechanics, 10 out of 10. This is a perfect book. Tons of jokes so good it's really it's like 11 p.m and in this section i'm gonna do the schrodinger equation but i don't want to do it right now i'm gonna skip the end of it but it's still gonna take a solid 30 40 minutes to do and i'm just gonna skip it i'm just gonna skip it we're gonna skip and pretend i've already done it and even in the world of physics perhaps the most bizarre part is quantum mechanics and right away, let me answer the question posed in my talk, which says, does anybody get it? The answer is no. So we don't get it. None of the people really understand at any instinctive level what happens in the world of quantum mechanics. So that's a good thing for you guys, because uh, you're not expected to follow this either. So you can just relax and <laughs> enjoy your drink. Uh, you, will, uh, you will achieve your, our stated objectives, which is that we all leave the room See, in the beginning, only I don't understand quantum mechanics, but after this hour, you too will not understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> so I'm spreading the ignorance around. So that's why I'm here. That's my mission. So no time has passed. It's, it's definitely not days later. And I would now like to use the Schrodinger equation to answer the question, what is the radius of the hydrogen atom? Because that's what this video is about. So the Schrodinger equation is similar to Newton's second law. It describes and predicts the behavior of a dynamic system. In our case, we have the hydrogen atom and the answer to the Schrodinger equation is the wave function. And in our case, that will describe the probability density distribution of the position of the electron, which is gonna give us the radius of our electron. But the thing is, is that I usually like to make my videos on like an eighth grade level you can't do the Schrodinger equation on an eighth grade level. Usually when people get to this point, they have like four semesters of calculus. Like we will have to do differential equations to answer this question. And if that means you cannot follow along to this section, that's totally fine. It doesn't say anything about your intelligence or your ability to do physics if you cannot follow along with differential equations just because you don't have the math training yet. That's totally fine. You can skip to this time step to skip this bit. It's like if you inherited your dad's violin and you've never played the violin before and one day you just decide to like take out your fiddle and take out your bow and take off your shoes and throw them on the floor and try to play a song you can't play a song, right? It would be laughable and embarrassing because you don't even know where to put your fingers. Similarly, if you just tried to do differential equations without ever seeing it before, you would have no idea what to do. By the way, that's how they teach differential equations, but that's a totally different video. It's just that I cannot do this without doing the complicated math. It has to be done. 
there are a lot of good videos showing the Schrodinger equations with like cartoons and like graphical descriptions of what's happening. But I've already done the cartoon version of the Schrodinger equation in this video. It's the Bohr model. We already got that answer. The whole point is to show you that quantum mechanics gives the same answer. So I'm going to do quantum mechanics. No shame if you skip to this time step. It's totally fine if you ever decide to take four semesters of math. Come back and join us on the Schrodinger equation ride. So the first thing we want to do is set up the problem. So imagine you're observing a proton of mass mp and an electron of mass me, not to scale. And the proton is a distance rp from the observer, and the electron is a distance re from the observer. These two things are going to interact via the Coulomb force. So you can write down the potential due to the Coulomb force as v rp e equals k e squared over r, where e squared is the charge. The r here is going to be the absolute value of the distance of the positions of these, which is this radius here, which is the thing we're trying to solve for, right? This would be the radius of our hydrogen atom. And kappa is just a shorthand way to write 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay, so we can write the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So you get h bar squared over 2 and p gradient squared. So this is your first time seeing the Schrodinger equation. This is a terrible introduction to it, but let me just say that here is like your kinetic energy term and here is your potential energy term and you get the energy. The way you usually think about this is that the operator is acting on the eigenvector to reveal the eigenvalue multiplied by the eigenvector. That's probably not helpful at all unless you know linear algebra, but that's fine. So the first thing we need to do is fix this coordinate system. So I'm going to do two things. Uh, one, I'm going to move the position that we're looking at. So I've already defined little r to be the absolute value of rp minus re. This will be the radius of our atom. And we can also talk about the relative position of this atom in space. So that's going to look like big R is equal to mp rp plus me re over mp plus me. And we can do the same thing to our mass. We'll define a big M as mp plus me. And then we'll make a reduced mass, which will look like mp times me over mp plus me. And now we can use these to rewrite our Schrodinger equation. Okay. <laughs> And this is very handy because we can now separate our Schrodinger equation into two separate equations because psi of r r is equal to psi of big R times psi of little r. And that means that we're going to have some e of big R plus e of little r equals our total e. So let's rewrite this Schrodinger equation again, but now as two separate Schrodinger equations. So now we have two Schrodinger equations describing our system. Number one is identical to a single particle moving in space. So this looks like if our whole 
hydrogen atom was moving as one body in space. And this is lame and boring and uninteresting, so we don't even need to care about this because that's easily solvable and that's not even what we're looking at. We're looking at the atom itself, the interaction between the electron and the proton. So we're going to focus on number two. So this is a three-dimensional Schrodinger equation. This R here is standing for x, y, and z, but we want to switch to spherical coordinates. So we want to go from x, y, and z to r, theta, and phi. So I will now expand our Schrodinger equation number two, which is now going to be our only Schrodinger equation, into spherical coordinates. Okay, it's a lot of writing and I'm so sorry. Oh my god, I'm so surprised I don't have that memorized anymore. Okay, so now we have our Schrodinger equation in terms of r, theta, and phi. This is the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom in spherical coordinates. We did it! Yay! Okay, so we know that our wave function is going to be in terms of r, theta, and phi. And now we can use the method of separation of variables to go from this giant Schrodinger equation to one that looks like this. And we're going to notice that my size starts to look like phi's. Um, it should be clear from context, I'm sorry. Okay, so now we will put this into our Schrodinger equation and separate everything out. Great. Okay, so I hope you can tell my lowercase thetas and phi's or my uppercase thetas and phi's, but I want to show you something. In this book, I told you there's an entire chapter dedicated to the hydrogen atom, which is here, and I should probably just take a picture of this and post it, but you don't really need to read the text. But all of the math we just did to set up this problem, um, editing Angela put up a timestamp of how long I've been working on this, and I want to tell you that we've just reached this equation here. He did all of what I just did in like a paragraph of text. So now what we're going to do is we're going to simplify this by multiplying everything by little r squared and then moving all the r stuff onto one side and all the angular thetas and phi's to the other side. All right, so we have stuff that needs r and stuff that needs theta and phi over here. And here we can use a math trick because on the left we have a function that depends on r and it is equal to something that doesn't depend on r. And that means that our left side has to be equal to some constant, which has to be equal to our right side and it has to be the same constant. So we can use that to start whittling down what we don't know here. So I'm gonna start with the right side, the angular part, and set that equal to c. So we have c equals k bar squared over two mu times one over sine theta, one over theta, d d theta, sine theta, d theta, d theta, plus one on sine squared theta, one over phi, d squared phi, d phi. So now I'm going to do a similar trick to what I did before. I'm going to multiply both sides by sine squared theta and then move the theta to one side and the phi on the other. We're separating out our variables. So what does that give me? It gives me 2 mu over h bar squared sine squared theta c 
minus sine theta, one on theta, d d theta, sine theta, theta d theta, equal to one on phi, d phi, d phi. Okay. <laughs> so, there's this math trick you can do where on the left we have something that depends on theta and on the right it doesn't depend on theta. So the left side, which I'm going to call left side number two, has to be equal to some constant which has to be equal to the right side number two. So the same exact trick. Very cool. Okay, let's start on the right side number two. So we have this differential equation, one on d squared phi, d phi squared is equal to some constant. For historical reasons, we're going to call this constant minus m squared. Now we have a differential equation that has two solutions. When m is not equal to zero, the solution to this is going to be e to the plus or minus i m phi. When m is greater than zero, the solution is going to be one or phi. And when you see people doing quantum mechanics and talking about n's and l's and m's and angular momentum, m is the magnetic quantum number and it can be positive or negative. Uh, because we're working in three dimensions, we have r, theta, and phi, we're going to have three of these quantum numbers that come out. m is the first one. Great. So we can work backwards and start working on the left side of this equation, um, which I have called left number two. So we can just plug in our solution for phi into our equation and start working through left number two. So we get one on sine theta, d d theta, sine theta, d theta, d theta equals c plus m squared on sine squared theta, theta. And things here are just going to get really tedious. Uh, I mentioned I wasn't going to do this whole thing just because it doesn't need to be done. The, the thing that is going to happen after lots and lots of algebra is that C has to be equal to negative L times L plus 1. And L is our second quantum number. It's the angular momentum quantum number. So you have your magnetic quantum number M and you have L, your angular momentum quantum number. And these are important, but not for our purposes because we're looking for the Bohr radius. And so I don't, I'm not gonna do this math. Uh, I'm sorry, it would be in a textbook if you wanted to look it up. And that's kind of the thing too. I showed you how much Shankar is skipping in chapter four. That's because it's chapter four. If this was a quantum mechanics course and I had given eight weeks of 45 minute, three times a week lectures, I wouldn't even need to do this algebra. You would already know where this was going and you would just be like, oh, it's L times L plus one. But this is a very short video and I'm gonna skip it and you're just gonna have to be fine with it. So deal with it. Like and subscribe. So now we have our second quantum number and we're gonna need a third one, but remember we're trying to find the wave function, the solution to the ground state hydrogen atom. So we need to take this solution and plug it back in to the angular part of our wave function solution. So we can now go back to the angular momentum part of our wave function and plug in our L's and N's and here's where we're at. I'm gonna write it like that, one over sine theta, d d theta sine theta d theta theta d theta equals minus l times l plus one plus m squared over sine squared theta theta. The solution to this is Legendre polynomials. And again, if we were eight weeks into a class, you would have already taken a mathematical methods and physics course. And when I said Legendre polynomials, you would be like, of course right? But that's okay. We're going to skip this part too. I'm just going to write down the answer. So, um, a Legendre, I'll write it down if you want to Google it. Legendre polynomials looks like this. M cosine theta. Okay. And you know, this is enough for our purposes. We've already got our M's and our L's. We see that those are quantum numbers in addition to the one we're gonna get from the R part of this equation. So now I'm just gonna throw in some spherical harmonics to match my Legendre polynomials and give you the YLM part of our 
hydrogen atom wave function, which will look like this. Okay, so this is the answer to the angular part of the wave function. So we're looking for the wave function that's nlm, which would now look like this, psi of n, I'm just calling it that, it's fine, times y, lm of theta and phi. Yeah, let's make that an r just to be nice. I just want to remind you what we're doing here, which is finding the wave function for the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest possible atom. This is so complicated. Imagine if you were just slapping electrons all over this. No, no, no. This is very simple and nice and easy. But also remember that Bohr didn't know about any of this. When Bohr was analyzing the atom, he had one quantum number. He had n, which we're going to get to. L and m didn't exist for him yet. And I think that's really interesting. You have your little cartoon picture of your atom with your shells, but what the L and M's do to your atom look like this. Like it's so much more complicated than nice little shells. But we're so close to finishing, so we're gonna keep going. Okay, uh, what we're gonna do is go back to left one. Let me remind you what it looks like. So we just did this whole bit and got this part of our wave function. We're now going to look at this little bit. I called it left one. Okay, <laughs> um, let me rewrite it down. So we'll do another mathematical trick where to analyze this, we can look at the large R limit. So, so what happens as R goes to infinity? Um, this will reduce down to everything that doesn't have an R in the bottom, and you get this differential equation. And <laughs> Again, the thing about differential equations is if, if it's possible to answer it, you just know the answer. When the solution for r here is going to be e to the minus a r. Um, and we're choosing the negative one because these are bound energy states. And here a squared is equal to minus 2 mu over h bar squared times e. Okay, we can check by plugging our solution into this big equation. Okay. Except we're still in the large R limit, so this will go to here. Okay. Now, we're so close to the end, and I am going to leave the next part as an exercise to the reader because I don't want to do it, but also I've always wanted to say that I'm leaving it as an exercise to the reader. But from here, you can get a squared is equal to minus 2 mu over h bar squared e, and you can get a is equal to k mu e squared over h bar squared. Okay, let's look at a here. So a is equal to k, which is 1 over 4 pi, epsilon naught, and then there's mu. Let me remind you that mu is equal to me times mp over me plus mp. Now me is so small compared to the mass of the proton that this just ends up being me times np over mp, and you can call that 1 and say that mu is almost nearly identical to the mass of the electron. So we can write me, and then you have e squared, and this is all over h bar squared. So h bar is equal to h squared over 2 pi, so that's 4 pi squared, 
Uh, so let's cancel things. You get A is equal to pi times the mass of the electron times E squared over epsilon naught H squared. And this is equal to 1 over A naught, which is the inverse of the Bohr radius. So we have now done the Schrodinger equation and landed back at the Bohr radius. I told you it was going to happen. Uh, let's look at this a squared is equal to the energy thing. So a squared is equal to minus 2 mu, but remember that's just the mass of the electron, over h bar squared, which is going to be h squared times 4 pi squared times e. Uh, so now we can take what we just found for a and square it and plug it in here, and we solve for e, which gives us negative me times e to the fourth over eight e naught h squared. And again, these are all constants or like measurable values. You can plug those in and you get negative 13.6 eV. So we've solved for the ground state of the hydrogen atom. And we found that the energy is negative 13.6 eV, just like just like Bohr got. So what we're neglecting here is the n squared. That's because we took this large R limit that's only applying to the symmetric condition. Um, we could go back and pull out that n, our third quantum number, if we needed to, but we don't because we're doing the ground state and that's fine. So what does this wave function actually end up looking like? So you usually write that as psi nlm, where you list your quantum numbers for the ground state n is 1, l is 0, and m is 0. So we get psi 1, 0, 0 is equal to 1 over root pi a naught to the 3 halves e to the minus r over a naught. And this is our wave function of the ground state of the hydrogen atom. We fucking did it, y'all. <laughs> um, so if you were to go back and put in your n's and solve for the standard wave function that works for any LNM. This is what that would look like just for completion on this little video. So this is your wave function for the hydrogen atom. This is what defines what the radial probability density of your electron looks like. This is how you define the radius of not just the hydrogen atom at the ground state, but all of them. And just for comparison, remember that Bohr's was just looking at energy, energy as a function of n, but you can't do that. It gets much, much more complicated. And I do want to remind you that this does get more complicated, right? This is the hydrogen atom. There's no neutrons. There's one proton. You don't have multiple electrons interacting with each other. This is the simplest case of the Schrodinger equation applied to an atom. And it's, it's so very, very complicated. I just want to mention some quantum rules for our quantum numbers that must be obeyed because of the way our wave function is set up. So... The first rule is that n, l, and m are integers, so like counting numbers. The second is that n has to be greater than zero. You can't have an energy level that's inside your nucleus. The third rule is that l can range from zero to n minus one. You can't have an l that's bigger than your m. And the fourth rule is that for m, it can range from minus l to plus L. And let me show that picture again of what these end up looking like. This is how you get all your S and P and D orbitals in chemistry. Bohr predicted this spherically symmetric atom, and that's just not what it is. Quantum mechanics is so important. You need your L's and your M's. <sighs> all right. The Schrodinger equation, which treats an electron like the wave that it is, 
arrives at the same value for energy that Bohr did. And, and that's very exciting and nice. And of course it does, because we saw it in the spectra. It has to be the same. However, the Schrodinger equation accounts for these angular momentums, your L's and your M's, that definitely exist and definitely have effect on the shape, structure, and behavior of the electron shells. Bohr does none of that. Bohr is not aware of any of that. And those L and M's, and you have even more, like you have the spin that I didn't even talk about. You have like a lamb shift, like if you slap a field on it, you get Zeeman splitting in the spectra. It's a whole lot of things that appear. But the radius of the hydrogen atom, which is what this video was addressing, it got, it got the same answer. Because those things, they affect the spectra, they affect where the electron sits, and like some like a really advanced level topic, it would affect the radius a little bit. But for our purposes here, Bohr and the Schrodinger equation give the same answer for what is the radius of the hydrogen atom, and that, that's really cool and interesting. Of course, Bohr misses all these other transition regions where you're moving between angular momentum spaces. He misses all these degeneracy levels. To him, all of these would look the same because he's just looking at n, but we're in the future. And we know about L and M, and we know that those levels, even though they appear to have the same energy level, are different states of the atom, and they would appear differently in the actual atom. Bohr got the right answer, but he was wrong in his approach, because in order to accurately describe the hydrogen atom, you need quantum mechanics, and we've done it. Yay! <laughs> So what is the radius of the hydrogen atom? Bohr imagined an electron that's a particle orbiting your nucleus, and in that case the radius would have been just the distance from the proton to the electron. But we know now that the electron is not a particle, it's a wave, and we have a wave of function that will describe the probability density of where our electron actually is. So if we want to calculate the radius we, we have to do like statistic. What is the most probable state of the electron, which will give us the most probable position of the electron, which will give us the most probable radius? Angela in real time is doing the Schrodinger equation later, and I have a feeling that Angela later is going to skip the part at the end where you actually get to the wave function. So the ground state of the hydrogen atom, your psi NLM, psi 100, looks like this. Should I just put up some more just for fun? But we're looking at the ground state. So to get the radial probability density of the ground state of the hydrogen atom, we need to take the square of that wave function and multiply it by a spherical shell element, which will look like this. So we can take that, drop the constants, take the derivative, and set it equal to zero for max probability, and we get this, which just gives us one is equal to r over a naught, which we can solve for a naught and find that the position of maximum probability for the position of the electron is r equals a naught. The most probable radius of a ground state hydrogen atom is, is exactly a naught. Point five, three times 10 to the minus 10 meters, 0.53 angstrom. We did it again. <laughs> Yay. But quantum mechanics isn't that simple. That's the most likely value. But what is the average value? What does the average hydrogen atom look like? To do that, we need to take the expectation value of the ground state wave function of the hydrogen atom. So our integral looks like this, and I'm going to be real with you. I just put this in my calculator because I didn't want to do integration by parts. I didn't solve this integral, and it gives us this answer. Uh, evaluated from 0 to infinity for r. So everything with an r in it kinds of cancels, and we get that the expectation value of the radius of the ground state of the hydrogen atom is equal to 3 halves a naught. So like more than a naught. The average radius of the ground state of the hydrogen atom is like 0.75 angstroms compared to the most likely radius of the ground state of the hydrogen atom which is 0.5 angstroms and that makes sense because there's like a tail on this value it can be a little bit bigger so it's going to pull the average away from the most likely so the average ground state of the hydrogen atom has a radius of three halves a naught rather than a naught so that is the radius of the hydrogen atom, depending on how you ask the question. 
uh, how you ask the question starts becoming really, really important in quantum mechanics, actually. I mentioned that in the Shankar books, he kind of takes a couple paragraphs to go into how you would actually measure this. Uh, so I thought that would be fun to do too. But like, I really care about your all safety. And I do want to warn you in real life about something I learned from the comments of my previous video, which is that as soon as you touch a piece of lab equipment, you are no longer a physicist. As soon as you touch anything in the lab, now you're an engineer. So while we did all of the physics and all of that was like theoretical physics and very important and wow, that's physics, we're, we're kind of venturing into engineering territory because we're gonna look at the spectra of the hydrogen atom, which is apparently engineering. So be careful. I, I work as a theoretical physicist, but when I was in graduate school, I did a lab tour and I touched a function generator and now I'm not allowed to call myself a physicist anymore. So I just wanted to warn you, like be careful out there, okay? In your opinion, do you, uh, what, what do you expect that's gonna happen in the development of, of physics in the future? So it's a very lively field. Uh, I don't think we are going to run out of questions in the near future. Excellent. The thing you can measure in a lab is photons. So the act of observation, which is pretty innocuous for you and me, right? Right now, I'm getting slammed by millions of photons, but I'm taking it like a man. <laughs> but for the electron, it is not that simple. One collision with the photon is like getting hit by a truck. The thing you can measure in a lab is photons. You measure electrons, not photons. So to look at the radius of the hydrogen atom, what you would actually do is take a hydrogen gas lamp and you would excite the hydrogen in it, pushing those electrons up to the higher energy levels, and then they would immediately come back down and release a bunch of photons, which you could observe with a piece of equipment called a spectrometer. So I just thought it would be kind of interesting to like price this out. Like if you actually wanted to do this at home and confirm quantum mechanics, here's how you would do it. So these are called arc discharge lamps. And what they do is just like a high voltage and you stick a gas tube in and it will excite all the gas in that tube, causing the, at the electrons in those atoms to go to their higher energy shells. And then they'll immediately want to go back down. So they'll go back down and discharge photons which you can see. And I, I do not recommend any of these websites. I just found the products on the internet. So don't buy this, but I just thought it would be interesting to price it out. So I found one of these for like $215. And this looks exactly like the one if you've done this experiment, you usually do it in the e &M course, like physics 202 or 212 or whatever it is at your university. This is like the last lab you do where you're given a random lamp and you have to identify the gas based on the spectra. This is exactly what it looked like when I did this lab. And then you would buy a hydrogen tube. So we're at like 250 bucks. So this will be the source for your experiment. To look at the spectra, you need a device that can look at the photons that are coming out of this and plot their wavelength on a little plot for you. So you need a spectrograph. So what you want is an ocean optics spectrograph. That's a good brand, but they're very expensive. And I don't think you can just like directly buy them from your, their website, but I found them on AliExpress. And that seems like a bad decision. Um, I, I think new, these would cost you like two or $3,000, but I see them on used sites for like $900. I'm gonna show you what the inside of a spectrograph looks like so that you can see how this experiment would work. So you can see my mouse, you can see my mouse. Okay, so here you would attach like an optical fiber and you would stick that optical fiber right next to your, your source, your gas lamp that's spitting out photons. And those photons would go through the optical fiber and into your spectrograph. 
okay uh so it would go here it would bounce off i'm sure this is a mirror and this is a diffraction grating so what it's going to do is it's going to take the light that is coming in from your source and spread it apart that's why this turns into a little rainbow it's going to spread it apart so the wavelengths are separate and discrete and you can observe them better in your detector uh, then it's going to go to another mirror and it's going to bounce all the way across to this is your detector and this this works exactly the way like a, it's it's not a CCD camera. I always jump to CCDs, but they're not CCDs anymore. It's CMOS. But what's going to happen is it's like a little silicon detector. Your photon will hit it and this detector will receive like half of them and convert those into electrons. And the electrons will go to the fancy thing about these is that it will go directly into a very nice little computer program like this thing you will be able to attach a usb directly to your laptop and a software will pop up and make a plot for you so you don't even have to do that part no math for you you just stick it in your computer and it's like here's the spectra these are usually optical detectors so you're not going to see the lyman series you'll see the balmer series Anyway, you'll, you'll see something like this. <laughs> you will see a floor and then these peaks that are gonna match those discrete energy changes in your hydrogen atom. And using this spectra, you can uniquely determine what atom was in your gas. And this is how you confirm quantum mechanics. And you can do it in your own home for a thousand to four thousand dollars if if you want you could buy the hydrogen lamp and then get a handheld spectrometer which is how they used to do it in the old days but i mean then you have to make your own plot uh so i really recommend the spectrograph if you're going in on doing this experiment for yourself so that's how they would do it um and this is the kind of thing that amo physicists are doing all the time obviously not with hydrogen but like very specific atomic systems and they can put a magnetic field through and like split the degenerate levels and do all these really interesting, very specific things that are predicted mathematically and then appear because quantum mechanics is so good at predictions and, and it's just really cool. Isn't it weird that Bohr got the right answer though? Not really. So Bohr suggests this correspondence principle where theories should kind of join, where they stop working, if that makes sense. Like, as Newtonian mechanics approaches relativity, the answers are not as correct, right? But there, there's this overlap where relativity and Newtonian mechanics give the same answer. And the same thing happens with classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. So Bohr was wrong, but it makes sense that he got the right answer. Look, that's the beauty. Once you got the right answer, everything, everything is going to be on your side. I'd like to show that again by looking at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that there's a limit to how precisely you can know a piece of quantum mechanical information. So accuracy and momentum times accuracy in position is equal to some constant. And the same thing for energy and time these two pieces of information cannot be fully realized in quantum mechanics. So let's look at Bohr's atom again. He found that the energy of the electron in the ground state is 13.6 B. So that's how much energy you have to add in to kick that electron out of the atom. This is equal to 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And we know that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So if we take that Using our known value of the electron mass, we can solve for the velocity, which gives us 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So this is the minimum velocity of the electron in the first ground state of the hydrogen atom. And we can use that to find the minimum momentum, which would be that velocity, times the mass of the electron, which gives us 1.99 times 10 to the minus 24 kilogram meters per second. So if we plug that into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and solve for delta x, 
which gives us about 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is, you know, a naught. It's the Bohr radius. Even though Bohr didn't know quantum mechanics, the, the world still knew quantum mechanics. Even if we didn't understand that electrons are waves, they're still behaving like waves. It does make sense that Bohr could get the right answer because he's using observed values and the world follows quantum mechanics, even though he didn't know he was using quantum mechanical values. It's really interesting, but it's not that crazy. But we also know that Bohr was wrong. As soon as you start looking at anything else outside of his very nice energy levels, you can tell he's wrong. Let's, let's look at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle again. So imagine you're looking at the n equals two state of hydrogen. So the electron is moved up in a higher energy level. This is not stable. The, the electron will almost immediately, in about 10 to the minus eight seconds, emit a photon and go back down to the ground state. That photon is the Lyman alpha photon and will be emitted at 10.2 eV, and Bohr could have calculated that if he wanted. This behavior would have been known by Bohr. He would have expected this to happen. But because of quantum mechanics, there's an observable effect of this that Bohr wouldn't have any idea about because he didn't know quantum mechanics yet. I'm sure he learned it later in life. That's fine. I don't mean to be shitting on Bohr. Like, he's wrong about everything all the time. He even, he went through a phase of like saying we should throw out conservation of energy, which is crazy. But has anyone ever been so wrong but also so inspiring to the people around him like he was wrong in a way that made other people figure out the correct answer which is not the worst way to be you know he still contributed quite a bit um anyway but he was wrong here he didn't know what was about to happen <laughs> so if we look at the heisenberg uncertainty principle again with that that situation where an n equals two hydrogen goes down to an n equals one uh we know that delta t is 10 to the minus eight seconds so we can calculate delta e here which is 1.05 times 10 to the minus 19 ergs. Who uses ergs? I hate that I've done that to you. Using the Einstein-Planck formula, we can, we can figure out from the energy, the wavelength of light that that would be. And it's E equals HC over lambda. So we get delta lambda is equal to lambda squared over two pi times delta TC, which gives us 0.014 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. So that is the uncertainty in the lambda. That means there's uncertainty in our ability to observe this transition on the order of 0.014 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. That means that when you look at the spectra, you don't get a nice delta function at exactly the wavelength that Bohr predicts it will be. You get a broad spectrum because we are unable to accurately observe this because quantum mechanics is real and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is real and we cannot exactly observe that wavelength. It's a little bit spread. It's a little bit uncertain. Bohr predicted about where the spectral lines would be but quantum mechanics explains like why are some of these lines brighter than others why does turning on a magnetic field shift these some of these lines why are some of these peaks more broad than others that's amazing quantum mechanics is it's pretty cool how many times have i said that in this video quantum mechanics is cool and fun and i recommend it and if you're planning on learning it this is a good textbook I should learn how to do Amazon affiliate links or something. I think so. Yeah, we all learn things which are not in our field, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I learn about the cell, the embryo, because in some sense it affects my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, a physics will affect your life, so be aware of it. And even if you don't become a physicist, when you do physics, you learn a few things which are important. You learn how to make responsible predictions. Mm -hmm. When you say you have a theory, it doesn't mean you woke up and dreamt of something. A theory is a very responsible way to speculate what will happen. Yeah. It's got consequences, mm -hmm. which can be tested. If you cannot test it, it's not a theory. Mm -hmm. And if you test it and it doesn't work, you have to be ready to give it up. And if it works, even your opponents have to accept that you're right. Uh, so these are aspects of scientific thinking that many people do not know. Mm -hmm. They say, well, I talked to this physicist, he believes that, the other physicist says, no, the opposite is true, maybe nobody knows what's going on. That's not true. In any living subject, 
there will be period when it's not clear who's right. It's not because anybody is lying, because it takes a while to figure out who's right. And if you're in a subject where you can actually establish who's right to everybody's satisfaction, that's not like many other things in life. Mm -hmm. Many other things, some people will say is good, some people will say it's bad, they can argue, they will say let's agree to disagree. In physics, you cannot agree to disagree because there's only one answer. Only one choice. And in the end, everybody has to agree. That's what I like about physics. Yeah, don't watch me do this. This, this is suffering for everyone. All right. Three, two, one.